one of my favorite new places that I just found out about. It's called Wybrook Farm in Honeybrook, Pennsylvania. I'm here with Dean Carlson. He's the owner. And I just love this guy's story. It's so interesting to me. Go ahead, Dean. Please tell me about how you got started with this whole farming business. Well, I had no background in farming at all. I had worked uh, in finance for 15 years, but I got really interested in agriculture. And I, I originally came to it as an investment because I thought farmland was going to be very valuable in the future. If you look at, like, human population continues to increase. The amount of arable farmland in the world is is decreasing. We ruin 1% of it every year. And then crop yields are starting to peak out. And so we're going to have problems raising enough food for the amount of people that we have in the world. And so that's going to make farmland a good investment. But what bothered me about that as that, that whole proposition was that if you look at the way that we grow food in the United States, it's incredibly energy intensive. We use 10 calories of fuel for every calorie of food that we produce. And so I didn't do anything until I found out or learned about this, this idea of sustainable farming. And, and how did you learn about that? Uh, mostly the first exposure to it probably was reading Omnivore's Dilemma. And then the Bible. <laughs> the Bible. And then watching Food, Inc. And, and reading books that I found out about through that. And I was, that whole world was opened up to me, and I thought, this is something that makes a lot of sense, and this is something that really... Um, interested me and, and became a challenge and something that I decided I had to do something about. And about how long did it take you to learn this? I mean, I can't even imagine all the things you need to know to run a farm like this. Well, I mean, I'm all obviously still learning things all the time. Um, I By no means do I know everything, but I spent like a year basically doing a lot of research and looking for farmland and finding this place and then thinking about what I wanted to do and talking to other farmers. Um, I learned a lot from from a lot of other people. I had no background in farming, and so I didn't come in with any kind of knowledge. It was something that I learned from other people, really. Now, the one thing I didn't mention before we started to talk was that you know everything here is done in a sustainable way. We have naturally raised animals, humanely slaughtered animals, and we offer that to the public. Um, all the things that you do, you rotate your crops and all that sort of thing. So how are things done differently here at Wybrook than the conventional food industry? Well, I think most people believe that, that most farms look just like this, that animals are raised outside, that they have access to the outdoors. But in reality, that's not the case. Most animals are raised indoors, especially pigs and chickens. Um, cattle are typically outside, but then they're finished in a feedlot. But we, like, we think it's important that they be raised outside where they have access to dirt and grass and sunshine. Um, I think it makes a big difference to the health and taste of the animal as well as it makes for um, a much greater animal welfare. Yeah. Now, you were talking to me earlier about how you thought that the, the, the trend would be a change in, in farming economically, you know, from an economic standpoint. So how is what you do sort of the way to the future as far as the economics of farming? Well, like I said, I, I think that that if you look at the way that we farm in this country, it's incredibly energy intensive. The only way that, that we can grow food the way that we do is that we have access to cheap fossil fuels, relatively cheap fossil fuels. And I don't think that's going to be the case in the future. I think that because we live on a finite planet and all of these natural resources, especially oil, are, are finite, that the cost of them is going to go up and then we're going to we're going to say, like, why did we make ourselves so reliant on this natural resource to grow our food. And so as the cost of that goes up, I think that sustainable farming will be the low cost option. And so, you know, grass fed beef is the perfect example. If you look at grass fed beef in the store, it costs more than grain fed beef. But if oil is 500 instead of 100, then grass fed beef is going to be a lot cheaper because if you look at the implied cost in grain fed, there's a lot of oil that goes into to raising the corn and going through the fields and delivering those grain products to the animals and then trucking beef all around the country. It, it just will become a lot cheaper to do things this way. Right, right. And I think it's so funny how, you know, this is the way things were done for millennia and now, uh, you know, people think that this is the strange, weird way to do things and it's just sort of funny to me, you know, yeah. how industrialization came in just maybe in the last 70 years or so and we've gotten so far away from this natural pastoral kind of way of doing things and um, 
you know, now people call us hippies. We want to get back to the land, and they're like, oh, you're hippies, you know? <laughs> yeah, and the, the way that I say it is, like, industrialization was wonderful for a lot of different products. You know, if you're talking about making automobiles, having an assembly line is arguably a really efficient, great way to do things. This is different because they're animals and not widgets. Right. So now, can you take me through a day in the life of, for instance, like a factory farm chicken and then one of your chickens? So chickens in the industrial system are raised for two purposes, just like they are here for eggs or for meat. Um, meat chickens in the industrial system are all raised inside of a house, a climate-controlled system where they're fed a, a high-nutrition diet that makes them grow as fast as possible. They are given roughly the size of a sheet of paper, an eight and a half by 11 of space to live their life. Um, so they don't have a lot of room to move around. They never see the outdoors. Even free range chickens theoretically have access to the outdoors, but they never do go outside. In contrast, our chickens are raised on pasture. We only raise them when the grass is growing. So we start them in March and we'll end them in the end of October. Um, and then we stop growing them because the grass is growing them. And I think it's important that they be outside because a large part of their diet is what they consume outside. You know, a lot, a lot of the diet is grass that they eat and bugs that they find outside. And it really results in a different type of, of meat. Um, it has a different texture, it has a different taste. Not to mention the animal welfare reasons for doing it. They get to live the life that they're meant to live. They live they're a chicken. Right, right. Well, and I know from an egg standpoint, too, there's a huge difference nutritionally between a factory farmed egg that you would get in the store or one of your eggs because, you know, when the chickens eat the grass, they're getting, that's where the omega-3 is coming from. Right. And you hear all these advertisers trying to advertise omega-3 in the eggs, but really, that's not really from the chicken, it's from the grass. Right. So if you're feeding a chicken, you know, soy meal or whatever, it's you're not going to get that. Right, so they're trying to find ways to feed them food or additives that give them omega-3s when the easiest way is just to have, have them. Have to eat grass, right. So in, in the industrial system, layer hens, uh, much, most of them never leave this cage. Um, and they're not allowed to move. They're, they're basically immobile yeah. inside of a cage. And even cage-free hens are inside of a house. They're on, um, you know, a sawdust floor, but they don't see the outside. Whereas our birds are outside, they're they're f truly free range. They don't have any fences around them. They have a dog there to protect them, but they eat a lot of grass. They eat a lot of bugs, um, and that makes a big difference to the nutritional content of the egg and the taste. Right. Uh, it's, it's a much better tasting egg. Right. So. With the same vein, like, can you kind of tell me about what a pig might go through in a factory farm? It's very similar to chickens. Um, you know, 95% plus of pigs raised in the United States live in pig houses. Um, there, there are farrowing houses where they're born and then they're taken into other houses where they're grown out. They don't go outside, they're on concrete their whole life, their tails are docked so that they don't bite each other's tails. Um, they're fed a high, high um, nutrition ration to make them grow as fast as possible. They're, they're, they're f prophylactically fed antibiotics because that makes them grow faster. Um, it's not a medical reason, it just makes them gain weight faster. Um, whereas our pigs are outside, they're on dirt, their number one thing they love to do is to root. So you can't root on concrete. But in the dirt, they can root, and so they get to exhibit what makes being a pig a pig. Um, and so it does take longer for us to grow them out. It is less efficient. It costs more to do it that way. But it's worth it because the meat tastes much, much better, and the pig has had a much better life. It's more natural. Yeah. So when you're talking about your chickens, about how long does it take? And you said from March until October? Well, our, we finish our chickens, the meat chickens, in about eight to nine weeks. Okay. As opposed to a factory farm that finishes That's them about? Six to seven weeks. Okay. And what's the size difference between a chicken that you would breed? It depends. I mean, you could, you could choose the size to be any that you want it to be, but in that, in that time period, we would come to a comparable size. Okay. And the, the breed that we use is slightly different than what's used in the industrial system. Like, in the industrial system, the Cornish Cross is predominant breed. It's been bred to have the most breast meat possible, but 
that's done in exchange for other yeah. other properties of the chicken. So basically their musculatory structure grows faster than their circulatory system or their skeletal system. And so they have a lot of problems associated with it. They have a lot of heart attacks. They can't really move because their bones aren't strong enough to carry all that muscle. Um, the chickens that we raise are great foragers. They're able to move around. They don't have heart attacks. So um, about, what is the normal um, weight of a chicken that you would sell here? How many pounds? Well, the, the dress weight will be about four pounds. Okay. So that would be roughly five to six pounds live weight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, when I go shopping, I can see a chicken, one chicken is eight, ten pounds. Yeah. You know, it's not uncommon to see right. that in the supermarket. So right. that's sort of strange. Right. Okay, so one of the arguments that I'm always hearing from people that are in the industry is that, oh, you know, we can't go back to the natural farm because that'll cost us so much more to do. You know, but when I talk to farmers or restaurateurs that buy from farms like this, they say, well, you know, there really isn't that big of a difference. In terms of the cost of the product? Yeah, the cost of the product, the cost of running the farm. It does cost more to do that this way. But like I said before, the, the biggest input in cheaper food is fossil fuels. And as long as that stays cheap, then it, it can be considered cheaper. The other, there's a lot of other outside what you call an, ec an economics externalities, costs that aren't included in what you pay at the register and that are associated with industrial food. One is pollution. You know, in these factory farm models, you end up with a lot of pollution problems. So when they raise pigs inside these houses, they generate a lot of manure. They have to find something to do with this manure. Um, oftentimes, they hold it in these outdoor lagoons. Sometimes you get flooding, and those lagoons overflow into the river. You know, who pays for that? You know, we all do collectively, but it doesn't show up in the price at the register. Same is true with, with uh, smell pollution and when they take that manure and spray it on the fields and it makes people sick around the pig farm, then that's a cost. Um, the other big thing is that industrial food, I believe, is actually causing people to be less healthy or making people sick. And so the cost of health care isn't something that you see when you buy something at the store, but it's something that we all pay for. Right, right. So by eating healthy, I think, you know, cost might appear to be more at the register, but in the long run, and if you take into account all these other things, it probably isn't. Right, right. Now let's talk about manure a little bit. What do you do with it? Well, we don't have that issue because it, it all comes down to the amount of animals that you have per, per acre or per like part of parcel of land. If they're overstocked, you're going to have a manure problem. If you have too many animals, animals per acre, you're going to have a problem with manure. For us, you know, we would probably like to have more um, because it's all like, like manure in small quantities is great. It's fertilizer, or in the appropriate quantities, it's great. Um, and we never run up into that issue because when you're talking about a grass-based system, you can ha only have so few animals per acre that it never becomes an issue. It, your manure is a blessing, not a curse. Right, right. Because you're actually moving it from field to field, correct? Like you, you move the animals from field to field. We, we move the animals and then the stocking rate is so low that it never becomes an issue. Right, right, right. It's actually benefiting the soil, etc. Yeah. Right. And then you were saying how, you know, when you move the, the cows to another place, then the chickens go into that area and they kind of clean up that mess. We do. Um, so the cat, we have a, a flock of laying hens that follows two days behind our uh, breeding cows. And that, that two days is intentional because the fly cycle is three days. And so what the chickens do is peck through the manure. They eat fly larvae, which decreases the amount of flies that the cows have to deal with. At the same time, they scratch around and spread that manure um, so that it doesn't stay in one spot. It gets moved around distributed. And so it breaks down a lot faster. Right, right. Now, what are some of the other sustainable techniques that you do here? Well, the, the, the biggest thing is, is grass-fed beef. That's the easiest one to explain because it's a, it's a totally renewable system. It's something that you can repeat over and over. And it's because grass is a perennial. So we don't have to replant it each year. By grazing it in a managed way, you actually cause the grass to grow back faster than it would have otherwise. So if you think about it, you know, the only inputs are sunshine and water. And those are two things that we don't have to pay for. They're renewable. Um, in this area, we get lots of water, lots of rain, um, and sunshine is free. 
So in a way, when we're eating grass-fed beef, we're harvesting solar energy because the grass is actually harvesting the solar energy. The cow's eating the grass and then we eat the cow. And it's, it's something that's, because solar is renewable, it's a renewable food source. Right, well it's sort of the natural way of things. It's how it things is. were meant to be. One of the greatest things about Rybrook Farms is their natural meat that they sell here. So we're here in the market. Go ahead and explain a little bit to us, Dean. Well, so one of the challenges of having fresh meat every week is that we have to send animals in for slaughter each week. And so every Monday, we send beef and pork into a USDA inspected slaughter slaughterhouse. But it's a place where they're done individually, one at a time. We know that they're going to be done humanely. In the industrial system, it's more of a, an assembly line procedure. Right. Whereas here, each animal is killed individually, and so therefore it's done in a humane way. Like I said, beef and pork all have to be done under USDA inspection. We bring the animals back here on Wednesdays, they hang in our cooler for a week, and then we break them down here and do all the butchering here on site. Our chickens are allowed to be, to be slaughtered here on the farm, uh, not under USDA inspection. And so we have a mobile unit that comes in every week and chickens get slaughtered. Their heads are cut off so that they never know what's really coming. It's done in a completely humane way. Um, and that all results in a product that you can taste it. it. It makes a difference that the animal isn't stressed through that whole process. Right. We care about every day that they're, of their life, including the last, so we wouldn't want to wreck what we've done all the other days by having sure. the animal stressed out. Yeah. Now tell me about some of the meats you have here. You smoke your own ham, correct? We do. This side is more pork and chicken. Um, the other side is beef. Uh, basically, we're using the whole animal, so everything gets used. They're, because of that, we have cuts that you might not find in the store, but we also, it's important for us that out of respect for the whole animal, nothing is wasted. And so we have a lot of things in our cases that you might not find somewhere else. But these are all things that are, that are good, good to eat, and it's things that people should learn how to eat. So like what kinds of things are we talking about? Like gizzards and uh, stuff gizzards like that? Gizzards for sure, hearts, livers, offal um, from all of the animals. But it, on the beef side, it's cheeks, uh, oxtail, um, asabuco, things that, that you don't normally find and people aren't used to cooking, but are things that we should incorporate into our diet because right. it's important that we use the whole animal. Right, great. And they, and they taste great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then you guys offer butchering classes here and cooking classes and... We do, we have uh, about two times a month we have butchering classes downstairs. Uh, we do a lot of cooking classes. We do a lot of uh, dinners here, so one of my favorite things is about twice a month we have a chef, usually from Philadelphia, come out, use the products of the farm to do a fine dining experience. We usually do five or six courses um, in this really cool environment, but it also gives people a way to interact with the chef and an interact and have a connection with their food that they don't find in a restaurant. And that was a big part of why I wanted to do this, because I want people to have a connection with their food. They can see with their own eyes where their food comes from and that that gives you a different experience than when you see something on a menu. Yeah, and I think that's the most important thing overall. For me it is. Yeah, definitely. One thing I love about this farm is that they walk the talk. They do what they say they're going to do and one of the things that I find is most amazing is if you look behind me here, they have a whole ceiling of solar panels. I love it. Tell me a little bit more about this team. So one of our, you know, in terms of sustainability, one of the most important things we can do is try to be as energy sustainable as possible. So we generate 52 kW of, of solar here on the farm. Uh, one of the buildings on the farm is geothermal, heated and cooled. Um, we do, we have, in this barn, we have a uh, still that we can use, take used cooking oil and turn it into biodiesel. And so we run our tractors on that. Um, the things that we use, the oil we use in our kitchen, gets basically recycled and going back into the tractors. Amazing. So how, how exactly do these solar panels um, go into the system? Well, it's a grid-tied system, so they generate electricity that just flows back into the power grid, and so our electric meter is running backwards when we're generating more energy than we're using. Right. Um, that's basically the most efficient way to do it, because then you don't need a lot of storage. Right, right. So, do you even have an electric bill then? 
<laughs> we do because we have so much uh, refrigeration that okay. goes along with the, the market and the cafe that we do have an electric bill. And it's something that I, you know, over time the goal is to, to not have to do that, so to add more solar so that we don't have to pay an electric bill. Right. Great. Amazing. Amazing. I totally would never even know that was solar panel, but the mm -hmm. whole thing is completely covered with solar panels. I love it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everything. Sure. I appreciate your time, and I hope everybody had fun today at Wagon Farm. It's a pleasure. Thanks for coming. Okay, so I'm here at Wybrook with some happy visitors who are regulars, I hear. So tell me a little yes. bit about why you love this place. Well, I think we love the setting, for starters, and what he's done to all the buildings and the farm. And we first found the market, um, and we're buying some chicken, and we bought the smoke. We bought the smoked chicken first, I think. Yeah, we bought the smoked chicken, and um, you know some of the local eggs from these chickens. The first time I've ever seen the chickens running around too. It's great. And wasn't that funny? Yeah, it's great. But um, it's just beautiful. It's yeah. beautiful and it's smart. I just, I think it's smart. Yeah, you told me that you, yeah. you know where everything comes from, mm -hmm. you feel good about what you're eating, yep. you know, and, and he really sticks to what he says he's going to do. Yeah, and he's got, if you ever talk to him, he's got the kindest, mildest manner. Yeah. You just want to keep coming back. Well, I love it in the summertime because they, you know, there's kids running around, you can bring your, you can bring your own bottle, you can bring your own kids and your own dog. Right. Well, how can it get better than that, right? Exactly. You know, and then they have music playing, they've got a barbecue going, mm -hmm. and so it's kind of like fun for the whole family. So. And it's fun to see, um, we've been here a couple times for the chef dinners, and the w one time we, they were preparing for the chef dinner, we didn't join them, but we were actually watching the chef. They were out here using that, whatever they call that, mm -hmm. the big fire pit thing, open but pit. Yeah. open pit, and um, it was great to watch them all work, and the chefs from Philly are just are happy to come here, too. Oh, of course. Well, yeah. they're all supporting each other, yeah. you know, and they have such passion for what yeah. they do. And the other thing I noticed, too, was a lot of people from Philadelphia and far away come here. It's pretty much a, a destination at well, this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I drive to get, you know, this kind of produce and this mm -hmm. kind of, of meat product yeah. if I knew, you know, exactly what was in it. Yeah. And I We're knew it wasn't lucky. coming from the... Yeah. We're kind of lucky. We live pretty close. Oh, so yeah. I feel like, wow, how did I get so lucky to yeah. be so close to this place? Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for talking with us. Sure. I see your delicious dinner and your bottle of wine, so enjoy the rest <laughs> of your good. evening. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks. Thanks. Everything we said here today is exactly the way we should get back to. This is where your food should come from. This is the way we should be eating. So now you're aware, go and share.